On May 7, 2024, less than 13 days before the anticipated start of the trial for Richard Allen, the man who stands accused of the heinous murders of Liberty German and Abigail Williams was supposed to start, his defense withdrew their motion for a speedy trial, and a new trial date was set for October 14, 2024. Allen's defense team made a motion April 30th to request a pretrial hearing, and on May 1st, Judge Francis Gall issued an order to conduct that hearing, along with prosecuting attorney Nick McClellan's motion in Lamine regarding his wish to exclude various third parties and motives that were going to be used to defend Allen. The state wished to preclude subjects such as their Odin theory, ritualistic sacrifice, various local men in Indiana such as Johnny Messer, Elvis Fields, Brad Holder, Ron Logan, Keegan, and Tony Klein being used. Additionally, irrelevant testimony from former Rushville Assistant Police Chief Todd Click and any confusing lines of questioning from geofence expert Kevin Horan. Some people have misinterpreted this particular request, and it is important to note that while McClellan does intend to present testimony for Mr. Horan at trial, he wishes to address the nature of the testimony as potentially confusing to the jury and have Judge Gall establish some guidelines on that discussion now. It ended up being another surprising day in court with Indiana Attorney General Todd Rakita in attendance, a heated and vigorous display of arguments by defense attorney Brad Rosie on various subjects, including withdrawing their motion for a speedy trial. And it ended with attorney Andrew Baldwin putting forth a 24-page motion for Judge Gull to be disqualified from this case. At 8.26 a.m., Judge Gull entered the courtroom in the well of the court. She was focused and relaxed and having discussions with different staff members. At 8.40, Rosie and OJ entered and set up their laptops. Uh, they sat down and were busy uh, working on them and focused. At one point, OJ did get up and was speaking to Judge Gall. Not long after that, Andrew Baldwin and his support staff entered. They rolled in a couple of trolley carts that I noticed, and they had uh, large case-type boxes on those carts that seemed to indicate that they were preparing for a full day in court. At 8.43, uh, Max and another young intern with uh, dark hair and a beard sat in the two seats at the end of the front row where uh, Alan's wife, Kathy, and mother, Janice Allen, typically sit. The gallery seating on the side of the defense filled up, and those in attendance included quite a few reporters. Mainstream media coverage of this hearing was not as extensive as the contempt hearing, and I thought it was highly unusual that Barb McDonald from Court TV wasn't there. And neither was Illinois defense attorney Bob Mata from the Defense Diaries podcast. Perhaps they were away or had previous commitments. At 8.45, Kathy and Janice arrived, went to the front row near Max and the other intern, and then they immediately got up and left the courtroom uh, with purpose. I thought they might have been briefed as to what to expect that day, but I'm really not sure. A couple minutes later, uh, Lieutenant Jerry Holman, Detective David Vito, Prosecuting Investigator Steve Mullen, uh, Nick McClelland, and Prosecuting Attorney uh, Stacy Diener arrived. Two analysts for the state also arrived, and I do believe that the female was Kathy Shanks from the laboratory division of ISP. Ms. Shanks was the female that uh, Superintendent Doug Carter thanked at the October 31st, 2022 arrest hearing for Richard Allen. Prosecutor James Luttrell, Chief Deputy for the Carroll County Police Tobe Lesenby, Attorney General Todd Rakita, 
rounded out those in attendance in the well. There was one row of family members for Libby and Abby, and they arrived uh, prior to the start of the hearing. Rosie was seated in the middle of the defense table. He was flanked by OJ closest to the gallery, and Baldwin was once again in the position to be closest to Alan when he arrived. At 8.55, Kathy and Janice came back in and took their place in the front row beside Max and the other intern. Both the defense and the prosecution were focused. They were preparing on their laptops and phones. They really were not speaking to each other very much. At 8.58 a.m. approximately, Richard Allen came in and looked for Kathy and Janice immediately. He did know where to look, and once he seen them, he looked away uh, kind of quickly, really. Allen was escorted by three Allen County deputies, as opposed to the IDOC. Tobe Lesenby stood behind Allen, rubbing his chin, and was watching him. Baldwin immediately leaned over to cover Allen from the view of the gallery, and he started talking to him privately for a few minutes. Rosie got up, he came around the table, and he kneeled down to eye level with Allen and also talked to him briefly. At 9 a.m., Judge Gull entered the courtroom, and Alan rose with the rest of the courtroom for Judge Gall, which I thought was interesting. Uh, he was very alert, and he clearly knew what was going on. The only thing I can liken his appearance to um, is a caveman, uh, because he just was... Um, unkempt with his hair and beard specifically. Uh, his He was uh, a little bit hunched over, quite frankly. Uh, his demeanor was alert, though, and compared to the March 18th hearing, um, he just, his like I said, his facial hair and, um, you know, his, his hair on the top of his head, it was very much in contrast to that March 18th hearing when he was clean-shaven. I was very surprised at how long his hair and beard were um, because it had only been six weeks. He looked very different in that regard. Judge Gull sat down and called to order the case for the state versus Richard Allen. She greeted Baldwin and Rosie, and then she said, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. Uh, she had entered a limited appearance, uh, and Gull was referring to Jennifer Auger at this point. She said she entered that order for the limited appearance, and then a discussion on OJ uh, ensued. Rosie, might have an impact on what OJ can present today. I would like to approach the bench and determine what the order might entail so that I don't cross any boundaries. A sidebar was had at the bench almost immediately. There was Gull, McClelland, Rosie, OJ. Uh, Kathy and Janice were staring off. They weren't looking at Allen. And uh, Richard Allen himself was actually looking up at the sidebar occurring at uh, Judge Gull's bench. Gull. On April 30th, a motion for pretrial was filed by the defense. Earlier, the Department of the Attorney General appeared on behalf of the IDOC, and I granted that motion. The court never entered it as an actual order of the court. It was entered and dated in CCS on May 2nd. I don't know what the disconnect was, but I did grant that. Are you ready to proceed on your motions? Rosie, I am. The motion in Lamine, it's their motion. They would have the burden of proof. Gull, you filed a motion for pretrial hearing on April 30th. You don't wish it? Pretrial matters and scheduling? Rosie, looking at the trial calendar, May 13th to May 31st in Carroll County, my interpretation of the email, quote, not more or less time. Naturally, you aren't familiar with the actual witness and exhibit list. You don't have a full grasp of the number of witnesses and exhibits. Each witness list has over 100 people, with probably 50% duplicated, and not all of them will be called. It's pretty obvious the defense will require substantially more time than two weeks for trial. The defense is coming in second, so that limits us. Are we splitting the time in half? I practically don't think we can do this in this short of time, even with Saturdays. 
We are looking for a practical solution. We haven't talked to Nick to see how long he will take to present. In terms of the law, I don't think I need to. It's a housekeeping or business matter. One of the burdens placed on the court is that the court must be fully aware of the scope of the witnesses and evidence that could be permitted. We aren't the most streamlined. We haven't had a lot of pre-trial hearings and motion and lamines. It's premature to set dates without this. More or less matters in a trial like this for jurors. Our position hasn't changed. It's still going to take us a couple of weeks. The state is probably going to feel the same way. Nick can speak for himself. McClelland, we've done what we can. The state doesn't have any objections. My best guess is we will be done by the 25th. We have 40 to 45 witnesses with 6 to 12 chain of custody witnesses. We've streamlined everything we have. Gull, what is your request then, Mr. Rosie? The first time I'm hearing that time isn't adequate is April 30th. Rosie, part of what professionals do, it ends when it ends. Maybe the court can issue an order that can further witnesses. 30 to 40% of the witness list now, as per Nick. So that's how fluid this is. We are at the mercy as to how long it's going to take them to present their witnesses. We have to coordinate experts. We require 15 working days to present our case. We are taking depots, trying to streamline the case so we are more efficient. Gull, do you understand? Well, maybe you don't understand. Jury Rule 4 requires I issue summons to jurors with the date May 13th and 31st. That rule requires that I mail a week in advance. Friday, April 19th, I mailed. April 22nd, the summons should have arrived. Again, until now, I've not been told that you need this amount of time. Do you have a remedy? I wish you advise this court before April 30th that you need more time. Rosie, here's a hypothetical. What if the state runs until the 28th or 29th? Do we get two days? The case will have to be retried. This will cause a problem. We are at the beck and call of the state. How are we supposed to do this? It violates his Sixth Amendment to not offer a full, complete, and adequate defense. I said this back in October. This request is consistent with what we requested. Go. That's your solution? I cannot ask jurors to have them add two weeks. I would have already notified. I've done hundreds and hundreds of jury trials. Three weeks for a trial is adequate. I'm now being told it's not enough. It's not my job to micromanage. It's my job to call the balls and strikes. I would have absolutely given you more time if you had asked right away. Under jury rules, I cannot give you an extra two weeks. Rosie, is the court going to divvy up the time? Gull, the court is going to ask you to be professionals. Rosie, he paused. Ma'am? Gull, sure. Rosie, the court has produced 450 jury responses, assuming 50 at a time for voir dire. Court could ask if the juror could spend more time. That might be an option. Ask them to stay and serve in the interest of civic duty and justice. Gull responded, and I missed it. McClelland, we tried to cut the fat as much as we could. We've streamlined everything. We can't predict how long the testimony will take for 40 to 45 witnesses. These may be reduced. We may have to add one. We've done our very best. Gull, court has made arrangements for lodging and transportation of these jurors. Are you asking it to rearrange? Rosie, that's why we're here having this professional discussion. I'm not hearing anything from the court. It's like you're not willing. They can keep going until the cows come home. I've never heard of a court setting dates. Gull, excuse me? You've never had a court set a start for a trial date? That's a shocking reality in my experience with my colleagues. 
We set a date. Rosie. Rosie was getting very animated and frustrated. He pointed down at Alan, and by this point, his voice had escalated very loudly. It's his right to a defense. It seems like you're inviting Mr. Allen's situation to be more tenable. Alan is looking up at this point because the I looked up from my notes because Rosie was so loud and Alan was staring straight up at Ro Rosie. He was very engaged. Gull, these six-way phone calls, emails, it's not how I do business. I don't know what you want me to do when I only found out about this April 30th. Rosie, request a five-minute recess, please. Gull, why? Rosie, I would like to have a meeting with my staff. Gull, does the state have any objections? McClelland, no. During the five-minute recess, Kathy and Janice talked to each other. Uh, the state was observed in the well talking. Law enforcement was on the far left in the well, standing and chatting. Uh, Tobe Lesenby came over from behind the defense table to talk to them as well. The interns were standing across the well uh, with the support staff, and the defense was gone to another location outside of the courtroom during the recess. 9.42, we were back in. Gull, in your paragraph number 15 for a pretrial, you are correct. Judge Gull then goes on to cite some cases that she has presided over here. She referenced Bob Leonard in 2016. She presided over the Richmond Hills case. Uh, it was set for 34 days with 140 witnesses, tried in 20 days with more witnesses, 2,000 items of evidence. The Pope case uh, was two victims. It was either four or 40 days. I presume it must have been 40. Uh, death penalty case, two and a half weeks with four victims. What would you like to do? Rosie, we did have a chance to speak to him. We had security staff to law enforcement officers, we are not able to speak in private. We have them standing next to us all the time. The same was true before when I was here. In future, could you please accommodate for privacy? Gull turns to the bailiff beside her, has a brief discussion, 10 seconds, and then she says, we can do that right now. Rosie, it's too late now. Gull, you can go now. Rosie, that ship has passed. Second, we've requested 15 business days to provide an adequate defense for Richard Allen. We are withdrawing the speedy trial request and wish to set new dates. Baldwin stands up at this point and speaks for the first time. We have a motion to request that you be disqualified from this case. And he motions some papers to Judge Gull. Gull needs to be e-filed. Baldwin, do you need a copy? Gull, no, I can get one. Judge Gull is very calm and she hasn't reacted at all. Unlike the public gallery that had their jaws just dropped, <laughs> Eyebrows raised and a few gasps. McClelland, judge, um, in terms of response to the defense's motions, we're frustrated. We are ready to go. I don't have a response to the 24 pages, which is the motion to disqualify. Gull, you can respond to that after. She turns to the defense. So you're waiving your right to a speedy trial then. Rosie, yes. Now, Judge Gull immediately sets the date for the new trial. So this was, in my opinion, expected and um, ready to be... Uh, I, I think, actually, that all parties had some if-then scenarios going on. And I do think that the defense expected the motion in Lamine to be uh, heard first because of the preparations that they clearly had for the court that day. 
Gall. The trial will be held October 14th to November 15th. If you can't try this case in a month, gentlemen and lady, there's something wrong. I see no reason why this can't be done. Rosie, you don't know anything about this case. Every day, this man sits down in that hole down in Wabash County. It's beyond me how you can know. Gull, I've been doing this for 27 years. Are you telling me that 30 days isn't enough? Why don't you have those discussions and let me know? It is patently clear that the defense and prosecution are dealing with each other in written form only. Rosie, inaudible. Gull, we are all here now. Why don't we have these discussions now? Rosie, inaudible. McClelland, I can't give you time. Court set aside time for trial. At the time I indicated the 26th, we will present in the most efficient and fast way we can. Not only for the state, the jury, we will do our best. I'm not here to say, give me seven days. Gull, I will grant the motion to continue the trial to October 14th through November 15th. Further discussions took place, but this is the end of my notes for this hearing, and it was not long after this that the hearing abruptly ended. As an aside, several witnesses were observed outside of the courtroom that day, including Brad Holder, who was in attendance with his attorney. Uh, Judge Gall set new dates to hear suppression motions still outstanding, along with the motion in Lamine. Three days have been designated in Delphi to hear these arguments, and they will take place May 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. I have no doubt that the families of Libby and Abby were disappointed and very likely upset by the delay to the start of the trial for the man accused of taking their young lives. Kathy Allen was observed consoling Janice as she cried, and it seemed like they were at a funeral. Suffice to say, I hope that the legal wranglings and issues that have plagued this case since the get-go can be sorted out, and we can finally see a proper trial to obtain a proper course of justice for these girls. Thank you for watching.